This is Criteria. Welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miris. I'm here with my co-host, James Majewski. Hello, James. Hey, Thomas. And we're here with our guest co-host, Nathan Douglas, live with us in the studio uh, again. Welcome back, Nathan. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to be back. Yeah, Nathan's been visiting me here in New York for a couple weeks, and uh, so we've taken the opportunity to, to have all three of us together here, and uh, we are, um, I think I said live. It's not live. I, I, what I meant is that you're in person and not I, live. I am alive yes. in person. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we've had a great time. We've gone to a bunch of museums, done a lot of sightseeing, and met a lot of people. and It's been very nice. And um, We're seeing some jazz tonight. Yeah, we're going to go see a jazz show later That's after right. this. Play some board games, you know. Anyway, um, we're doing two connected episodes this month. As we mentioned in the last episode, we did the little... The Flowers of St. Francis by Rossellini, um, and uh, that's one of two films about St. Francis that's on the Vatican film list, and since his feast was this month on October 4th, we're taking the opportunity to cover both of these films now. Um, we loved The, the Flowers of St. Francis, and uh, that film focuses on the, the whimsical side of St. Francis and the, the, the merriment of Franciscan life, um, while still being a, a serious spiritual film. This film, not so much on the merriment side, more on the uh, the, uh, the the spiritual suffering of Saint Francis, or so- something something more along those lines, and the contrast of the materialism of the world versus his uh, life of poverty. Now, um, the film we're discussing today, not a well-known film, uh, though it's by a semi-well-known director, Francesco from 1989, an Italian film, but in English. Uh, directed by Liliana Cavani, uh, starring Mickey Rourke as St. Francis and Helena Bonham Carter as St. Clair. Now, Cavani is best known, I think, for a film called The Night Porter, from which I, which, which from what I understand is a rather perverted film about... I, I, uh, I read a review of this film, Francesco, which described her other work as being Nazi sexploitation. So uh, that's odd. And she made three films about St. Francis. One of her first, if not her first films, was uh, I think a two-part film for TV about uh, about St. Francis in 1966. Then she made Francesco, which we're discussing today, in 1989. And then in 2014, she also made a TV movie, oh. I think also called Francesco. That's not too long um, ago. Yeah. No. And um, uh, I found one interview that was just about her St. Francis films, very short article, and she was asked why, and she said, I'm not a religious person, I'm an atheist, but I was struck by the adventures of this kid who 800 years ago had intuitions and an ecological vision that's ahead of its time even today. It really took the current Pope to make the figure of St. Francis real. Now, this film doesn't really focus on the ecological stuff. Except for in some of his prayers, no. uh, it does, I wouldn't certain, certainly wouldn't say it exaggerates it. It, it. Yeah, you know, you don't get him, you know, talking to the birds, or it's just not really much. I guess there's the part where they refuse; none of them wants to kill the rabbit. Yeah, but uh, well, what I remember of Brother Sun, Sister Moon was that it it leaned more into that right, side of it right, yeah. than this film does. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say this this film is probably less on the ecological side than the Flowers of Saint Francis was. Um, right. Yeah. So I I don't want to keep talking uh <laughs> before giving you guys a chance to sort of give some initial thoughts on the film i will say i didn't hate this film on the whole as much as i expected yeah i wouldn't <laughs> say that it's a good film much less like a good film about saint francis um but uh overall there are some really weird moments right but overall based on just having read stephen gridanis's review a couple times in the past I think he gave it an F. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, I haven't read it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm very sympathetic with his perspective. I I, I would probably, um, depending on how we read one scene in the movie, I would give it, I might bump it up to a D yeah. with a generous reading. Of well, I think scene. I know what, you, what scene you're talking yeah, yeah. about. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, 
I I like I hate to say I hate to say this, but I I wanted to dislike this film more than I ended up doing. Um, uh-huh. So you know, I think that that like you know that like that that says something about like the the spirit with which I was going into my viewing of this. It, I was kind of cynical. I was a little pessimistic, and um, I gotta say that uh, by the end of the film, um, yeah, I just I just didn't. I didn't hate it the way that I thought I would. Sure, there are like a few things that um, maybe, you know, irked me a bit. And there's one scene in particular that I could have done without. But, um, you know, I guess I kind of felt like uh, just by way of like first impressions, one of the first things I'll say about this film is that I, I kind of appreciated the oddness of Francis and Claire. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that... Uh, St. Francis, as with a lot of saints, is a little odd by worldly standards, mm-hmm. you know? Like, the world doesn't quite know what to make of certain saints. Right. And, um, and so, so a depiction of, of, of a saint like, like St. Francis of Assisi, I think is going to have to grapple with that problem of, like, you know, how do we make this, you know, maybe palatable is the wrong word, but like, how do we make this presentable in a way that people aren't going to just like, uh, totally reject it as like, as, um, uh, like, like farcical or grotesque or irreverent, you know, while at the same time acknowledging that this was a challenging figure, you know, the fact that he takes off his clothes in the middle of like a court setting with like in, in like a legal uh, dispute with his father, you know, that's provocative. Right. And that's in like everything that we, we have about uh, St. Yes. Francis. We know that that happened. Yeah. So you can't just like gloss over these things at right. the same time. You can't like, you know, um, like revel in them, which I think that maybe this film in a couple of instances uh, does, but yeah. but I think that that on the whole, like it it ended up being something that I appreciated that that it 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 did see seem to try to attempt at least to to grapple with this like vision of the saint um and in and this vision of Saint Francis of Assisi in particular as being kind of an oddity, you right. know. Yeah, it's interesting that you start there because that's where Grey Dana started his review as well. Uh, and, and he he's I forget he said there's like basically three approaches you can take. I can't remember what the third one was. The first one was like, you know, show what's the parts of him that are appealing to modern people. You know, like the flower child kind of right. thing. Right. Right. And then the second would be focus on the stuff that's strange about him. And his complaint was that he felt like the film didn't it took like the worst of both worlds in a way mm. like it, it sort of included the odd, but not in a way that's like, this is odd, but calling us to a greater spiritual height. He didn't feel like that was really right. Like there was really, we did, we went to the heights, you know, right. in this film. Um, I would, I would agree though, that I think the the best thing I can say about this film is that it takes Francis seriously as a saint and it doesn't go, it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't like demythologize him at least in any like overt way. Right. Um, And it doesn't like go to the usual cliches about him, but it is a deeply weird film. And I'm very sympathetic to great Annis's claim that like it basically portray, it basically conveys like very little that is recognizable from like the portraits of St. Francis we get from like the early medieval biographies, which is of a, uh, a very cheerful, sweet, extroverted, you know, um, outgoing, charismatic figure. In this case, you know, he is good looking and he has a nice smile when he chooses to smile, but he is kind of like a tongue tied mumbling weirdo in a lot of the, in a lot of the film. I think St. Clair is, is almost wholly undistinctive in this movie. Yeah. Um, partially because they, they give her, um, no distinctive role. She's one of the brothers. She's out on the road with them. Much is made of the fact that they're concerned about her sharing in their lifestyle as a woman and the dangers or potential scandal of it. Um, but it's weird because it's a total non-issue because from, I, I mean, I'd spent 
earlier today I spent some time reading about her and, and from the very beginning she was in monastic settings mm. they they immediately found a, a a temporary home for her with some benedictine nuns and then until she could get like a place of her own and so her, her entire thing was you know she had her own rule that she spent just like this this movie shows the struggles of saint francis you know with the rule and and the the attempts at compromise that people are making she struggled had a lifelong struggle she literally died two days after her rule was finally approved mm -hmm. um so she and a big part of that from the beginning was the the life of enclosure which was a traditional part of female you know monastic spirituality you know for for centuries at that point right um and we don't get any sense of her having like a distinctive spirituality or i don't know in, yeah. Yeah, if anything yeah. it kind of muddies the water a little bit in this relationship between Francis and Claire because you know it's not it's not totally clear that she isn't just kind of uh you know uh uh taken up with Francis himself, you know. Yeah. Um uh although it's although it does make a point of saying like that was true of all the companions. Right, 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 yeah. right, right. But in her case like when they first meet and I'll, I'll let you jump in in a moment, Nathan. But, you know, when they first meet, there's like this exchange of glances that's almost flirtatious, mm -hmm. you know, and and like it's definitely on his side, it's certainly flirtatious. Right. Yeah. Right. And this right. is before his conversion. Right. Yeah. Right. So. So, you know, it's it's like uh, I, I think that she does get kind of short shrift a little bit yeah. in this in this film. But... So, Nathan, your initial uh, thoughts. Yeah, my initial thoughts um so i was kind of pleasantly surprised by the film like you guys i didn't have the highest expectations going in um the thing that has always leaped out to me about it from the beginning is that of all the films on the vatican film list this is i think the only one that is completely near or nearly completely unrecognizable to a, a cinephile who's kind of coming mm -hmm. to the list and saying hey what's this list all about mm -hmm. um all these films on here you've heard of, most likely heard of to some degree or another, but then you have this 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 Francesco that's just uh, this this total right uh, mystery. And so the the question that kind of arises from that is, well, um, why haven't we heard about this before? Um, if it was obviously significant enough to make it onto this this list of only forty five films, there's a couple of possible answers to that. One is. Uh, maybe it's this hidden treasure, you know, this is kind of, you know, the cinephiles always love to find uh, their, their, their champion to champion, like, you know, these, these um, underdogs. Right. So perhaps, uh, perhaps somebody worked really hard on this list to bring a, a totally um, hidden gem uh, onto it, which we'll all benefit from. Or the other possibility is that it's a completely nondescript, forgettable uh, film. That's it's neither here than there. To answer that question, at least what I'll give is that it um, it is, from what I can tell, a largely nondescript film. Uh, it's it's not a uh, I would not call it a bad film per se, but it is a it is kind of a very standard uh, historical drama. You know, mm -hmm. it's um, but just with a lot of weird vibes. I wouldn't even go that far. I mean, I think the story of Francis is weird. Like there's enough weirdness in the story to, um, you know, yeah, it, it pique the interest of a of a filmmaker who wants to like, tackle it. And... Therese had weird vibes, you know, the film on Therese that we watched that yes. had weird vibes. But this, this film has weird vibes. It puts weird on top of weird. Uh, on in like a couple instances, but not really like that. I I wouldn't go so far as to say that. There's a couple of scenes that are a little odd, you know, like in 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 a way that didn't have to be uh -huh. aside. I think the music contributes a lot yes. to the weird vibes. Yeah, but that I think has a lot to and do with the fact that throughout. this film is coming out in 1989. Right. And they got some like synth guy to do. Well, that's not a synth guy. It's Vangelis, the oh. great composer Whoops. of synth soundtracks. <laughs> First of all, he's, he's not a great composer, but he is. Oh, man, we're going to Well, uh, uh, forgive me. Uh, forgive me. I don't know who, who Van, Vangelis pop, is. Pop uh, so if you don't know who Vangelis is, excuse me, was, he died um, He did Chariots recently. of Fire. Yeah, he did oh, Chariots of Fire. Oh. He did Blade Runner. Wow. He did Conquest, uh, 1492, Conquest of Paradise, uh, which was the first album that... Okay, well, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that sounds um, great. But I will say the music is kind of odd. It's an odd choice well, for this it's film. It's not simply the case that the music is odd, but it's kind of more the use of the music. It's as much an right. editorial decision. Right. Right. Uh, I wouldn't really lay this at the feet of the composer. It's definitely my least favorite Vangelis score that I've heard, but the sequencing of it and the way that it's, it's edited into the film uh, is completely... I could not really get the reasoning behind it. Here's what I would uh, say about the music. 
is which, that... which I would say contributes to sorry, which I would say contributes to the weird vibes that you're kind of talking about, and that the rhythmically trying to find a place in the film of like getting on its wavelength. Right. The film is the music is kind of doing this very like trancey kind of right. dreamy, um, somewhat sentimental, cloying yeah. kind of thing. It's also got that electronic timbre to it so right. it's, it's got this uh, other ethereal otherworldliness but it also never develops an actual theme is it right right there's, right. there's no real like, like if there had been some cohesion. like chariots of fire anthem you know yeah like so, totally yeah so what we're left is is we're left trying to find our footing in the film and and music is of course a very uh good uh speedy way of finding your footing uh with a film what a film's trying to do in this case you never really get there it's kind yeah. of just floating around insofar as this soundtrack rises to the level of being music it's like extremely nondescript music of the time but there's like this one particular like synth sound that he uses that keeps coming up in weird places that's like very unnerving mm-hmm. so it's not even like really music it's just like a weird synth sequence like synth sound you right know, it's kind of like a weird bell kind of right, sound right, 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 you right. know uh and then that's 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 what contributes to the like the weirdness you know as, mm-hmm. as well yeah um, like the emotional like why am i what, what what emotion are they going for here that kind of thing i want to i want to just like uh thomas i think like the fact that you keep using weirdness as a descriptor i think you kind of need to define what you mean by weirdness in, in like kind of along cinematic terms like you kind of need to weird no, because like uh, I mean, the the life of like we're talking about the depiction of life of a saint, you know, who did miracles and was a very um, strange guy, you yeah. know, in a worldly sense. So like, what um, you know, weirdness is part of the package. Okay, so yeah, fair what, enough. Yeah, well, there are some stylistic weird aspects of the film, which I think uh, it's not immediately apparent why they're doing it. I, we talked about the music. There's there's also ju- there's a couple of things that are like one thing I would say is weird is just Mickey Rourke's performance at certain points. Like the fact that he is sort of like just mumbling and repeating words. There's a, there's a whole scene where he's far away from the camera. So I guess they're doing it on purpose, but he's talking to this Cardinal who is talking way louder than him. And he's almost talking like under what the Cardinal is saying and just sort of like mumbling. Oh yeah. 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 Saying. Yeah. That's a weird scene. He's like praying through the conversation. And then like yeah. every once in a while, like, like, like he enters into the conversation with a response and then goes back to praying. Yeah, is that what he was doing? He's okay. Got, yeah. 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 It's, it's like a, it's, a, it is kind of odd. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then there's the scene where Francis and some of his brothers go to the Pope to get their initial, like sort of oral temporary oral, like approval of the, of their order. That scene is more stylistically weird than it is weird in content because it's pretty like, um, like in the way that the court, the papal court responds is like pretty like just historical as to the concerns about all these new groups, like enthusiastic, yeah. like penitent groups that had been form- forming in the Middle Ages. So what they're saying is normal. Again, it's Mickey Rourke's performance, and then some of the musical cues, and then like just that, like there's this whole line where um, they're like, "How will you survive?" Like you know, in like radical poverty in this like world, and he keeps saying like, "The footprints, the footprints." Or the footsteps, or something. Yeah, he's like not saying even. Well, like I don't even sense. think I don't even think he's repeating it. I think it's just that 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 audio sample is repeated. Oh, really? It's like it's like drilling into the. And Pope's then we get ear. this like this like pan onto the cardinal's ear. And yeah. It like it's just this, <laughs> this creepy music, and then we get like the uh, the Pope being like super nervous, and all these like super close zooms. On yeah, people's close face. close zooms on people's uh, faces. It yeah. is. It's that's that's like the oddest. The oddest scene in the in the like Astonished not in not sense. in its content, but in yeah. like what's sort of layered on top, right? And in the way it's delivered, yeah, yeah. And then the other aspect of weirdness. Well, before before we do, what why do you think the director did that? Like that's a stylistic, that's a formal choice. So I'm curious what why yeah you know what well, reason think, do you think she may have had to do things that way? Um, I don't know why she chose to make Francis in general like incapable of like speech like normal speech in like importance whenever like an important situation arrives when he's supposed to speak because that happens a number of times um i think that the stylistic thing with the ear is like as you said earlier when we were talking about before we recorded um it's just like yeah it's going into the guy's ear and he's listening and um i think the 
close zooms on the faces of the papal court. I don't know. It's like maybe they're being confronted with something, you know, something like that. And, uh, and um, the music, I don't, I guess, yeah, I don't know about the music. <laughs> but The music, I think, I think we can chalk the music up to being like of its time. You know, I don't think that it, it probably sounded yeah, as why odd is it or as to be dissonant. Creepy? Yeah. Well, I don't know that it sounded as, as, as like jarring to a 1989 ear than right. it does now. So maybe what you're hearing is creepy was more just sort of like ominous and like, you know, like, like overwrought or something. There's parts you know? where like, there's another part where that same like synth sound is used, I think, which is when, um, that court scene with Francis and his father uh -huh. is happening. And there's this t part where like his father makes this appeal to him. And then you see St. Francis sort of taking it in and thinking, and it's right. I I forget exactly what point in the scene it is, but it's that same like creepy synth scene. So it could be like, you know, deliberation, someone being troubled. But I think I I also wonder if it's like an attempt to suggest like the Holy Spirit at work or something like something like yeah. sort of otherworldly. Yeah. You know, uh, I it's I find it interesting you use creepy um, as a as a descriptor for it because I I don't really recall feeling creeped out it's unnerving um in those instances there was yeah. one instance i felt a bit creeped out by but like um but with with sort of uh I, yeah I, I guess what i would interpret it as is, is is a um an atheist director trying to use the tools of film to express you know a spiritual kind of intuitive effect that's happening uh, upon the people encountering francis she's just she's, she's trying to capture how people fell under his right. spell so to speak Right, uh, and because the papal audience in particular is 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 doing that with trying to you know use these more visual audio methods. Right, to and I think say that. I think what's interesting like, about that comment is that like because Mickey Rourke's performance is not telling you why people felt, right felt under right right, spell, right right. You know? I think that I think an excellent case um, in point is when uh, one of the little brothers goes to the cathedral naked and begins to preach. Uh -huh. It's like. This is completely not gaining any conversions. You know, right. it's like it's not working at all. Yeah. Now the the film wants to suggest that it might have worked if not for the sort of obstinacy of the people. Uh -huh. You know, and when when Francis arrives and begins preaching to them, there's a moment where the film wants to suggest that this is working. Right. But the whole time we're watching it, at least this was my take, was like no, nope, no part of this is attractive. No part of this is like spiritually compelling. Yeah. Even when Francis arrives and pulls a crucifix down and begins to preach yeah. with it, it still was just like, no, nope, like this is not, there, there's nothing like, well, okay, I won't go so far as to say that, that there's nothing there, but that like it did not sort of have that, that, uh, that that it didn't like savor of spiritual wisdom in the way that you would expect it to if you're going to make that bold of a play in this well, film. Well, this is this is know? part of the film's treatment of nudity, and I want to save the snow scene for like a separate treatment. But yeah. but like we're like dancing around yeah, this yeah. scene. <laughs> yeah, but but I want to point out the scene where the scene you just mentioned and the scene in the court because it, it totally has to do with how the actors are hand, are being directed to handle it and the fact that it is this not this liberating and free and innocent like adamic pre-fall kind of thing that i think that it often suggests in the franciscan legends uh and and more or or history i should say or both you know and more like like he's going up there and he's not really wholeheartedly doing it they're both shamefacedly you know covering their you know their their uh their, their midsection yeah, yeah. and uh and it's 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 sort of like this this total shame thing whereas you know in the story we don't we don't know how this actually worked out when he sent this brother the story that 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 is told is that who is it brother rufino um i think yeah i think so um saint francis i think he i think it's rufino that, that Ruf, rufino is is um reluctant to preach for some reason and because he didn't obey saint francis immediately saint francis tells him as a penance to go preach in the cathedral naked and then saint francis sort of chides himself for giving such a intense penance and he's like okay i'm gonna make myself do what i've 
the sorts of things that I'm telling my brothers to do. We get this too at the beginning of the Flowers of Saint Francis, right. where he acknowledges that he's some somehow sometimes like burdening yeah. his brothers yeah. with this life of penance that he's taken on himself. Um, but and in the in the end of the story, Francis, not in the film, but the, the story that I read, Francis goes in naked himself and joins him, and then you know people are edified. But that's not really how this works. There's not this like joyful like abandon in either case. In the case of his you know, his father either. And, 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 you know, who knows exactly what the vibe was as it went down, but, you know, in, in the, in the, the sense that we're given, and maybe this is that sort of the, the retrospective triumph of the hag hagiographers, you know, the vibe you get in reading these stories is St. Francis says, okay, I, God, my father in heaven is now, it's like, he's making this loud declaration before the people. And then he's sort of like, joyfully like, takes off his clothes and the bishop you know approves his new way of life and stuff but we get the, in this film we get we get a much more sort of like shame-faced kind of thing and only later do we see that saint francis is like cheerful after having like faced this this difficulty with his father um so the, the way that the film treats nudity is a little bit more fallen and less like savoring of you know sure naked without shame yeah. And and then of course there's also this like totally unnecessary this kind of a gross nudity of like all these corpses in a pile when yeah, we see right. the, the war scenes at the beginning of the film. Right. Um, but um, well, that that's part of I think I think one of the things this film is doing is responding to uh, just as Flowers of Saint Francis was kind of responding in its own way to the hagiographical tradition and trying to do something kind of more uh, real. Yeah. You know, uh, from like a modern secular viewpoint, this this film is in its own way responding to to that and other Francis films that it probably thinks don't go far enough. Yeah, right? I think you, you know? can see it's, the through line yeah, from Flowers of St. Francis to this. We're, we're, we're just one hair removed kind of from Ridley Scott realism, you know, right. uh, where you get every every bit of dirt and blood and right. all that. You know, it's, it's that part of the general trend towards that uh, that we see in the second half of 20th century film. But again, for the most part, it's not demythologizing in the sense of saying the spiritual is just his imagination or the stigmata isn't real or anything like that. It's more the emotional realism and like his personality being like really, he's not this like colorful. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I guess figure. also what I would say is a general lack of spiritual wisdom that like, so my issue with that cathedral scene, um, you know, was not like the depiction of it as like the... Um, the sort of like superficiality or like the sh the seeming like shallowness of it, mm -hmm. like like we talked about, we've talked about before, like the the confusing like the idea with the portrayal. Like I felt like there was a a in the cathedral was the presentation of an idea, but not actually like the sort right. of incarnation of this reality that would have been shocking and compelling and edifying you know so like if you're gonna do that if you're gonna take that 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 chapter from francis's life and the life of, of his brothers you know and dramatize it then i think that you you set yourself a great challenge yeah in that sure. like Absolutely. you have to find a way to realize this and and i i think that there that's like the perfect uh case in point for me of how this film um you know maybe realizes one side of of uh, of of like if we think about the historical francis if we think about him as like being this sort of like multifaceted all these different s sides to to him and to this phenomena of like the beginning of the franciscan order um it maybe captures a few of those, but then it leaves yeah. out whole others. You also, know? the preaching itself, kind of that's preaching that's itself, a, like is sort of non-existent. Right. That that that's was why. a big that was a big deal for me because it was like it wasn't just go there and be naked in the cathedral, and then like sort of like half-heartedly like say like like accept peace, peace is everything, or, peace yeah. is everything. You know, it's like yeah. what you know. It was go there and preach, and like now if we had heard some like Franciscan sort of preaching of the poor people who died or something, yeah, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Like, this sounds like more of a criticism than I really want it to be. I don't want to like make too fine of a point with this, but like, but but you know, I th I think it's like it's it it is a shortcoming. You yeah. know, yeah. we see more joy, less joy in St. Francis a lot of the time than we see in the other brothers 
and in the sort of retrospective parts of the film because this film is told as the brothers. It's sort of like the beginning of season two of The Chosen. Where I know, like I thought about it's that. It's the brothers, um, right down to some of the hairstyles, honestly, but but uh, like uh, where, where the brothers are um, are recording their stories about St. Francis and St. Clair uh, is, is there too. And they're telling Brother Leone, I think, and he's writing down like the sort of first life of St. Francis. Um, and uh, honestly, like you get more sense of a more of a sense of joy in there in those scenes than in the actual scenes of the life of Francis in the film. Um, so what I was going to say is the, the other form of weirdness in this film is just like the weird takes on some of these tales from St. Francis's life, like like the actual like the strangeness of the way. I mean that that would be a good example, but um, just sort of like the 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 shifting of the emotional tenor of so many of these stories about St. Francis, the way that it does. Um, and in some cases, like there, there is a little bit of sort of um, subversion for, for instance, like the fact that we're given, we're given to, to believe that the beginning of St. Francis's conversion was him coming upon a, illegal vernacular translation <laughs> of the gospel and it we're told explicitly like that's where it all began for him yeah is like now why did it have to be that was it because he couldn't read latin like you, you know like uh so he, he's got this illegal gospel yeah. that he keeps there's and, also weir- a it, weird the stakes with that are like super high because he's is discovered like at the like execution of this man who translated the gospel, right. you know, it's like they're, tra- they're, they're, they're executing him for being a heretic, which, I mean, I don't know if that's like, like, was it really so bad to translate the gospel yeah. into the vernacular, but, know. but like, they've like literally like hung this guy upside down and, and flayed him. Yeah. And then that's when Francis discovers the the gospel and it's like, yeah, he's reading in prison. Yeah. Was, like the stakes yeah. around that are like, really high now, the part of his conversion they do get right is that he says at the beginning of his testament that like his conversion had to do with like interacting with lepers and right. sort of he was originally really scared of them and hated being around them and then sort of converted from like doing acts of service for them um but uh yeah i mean i was gonna say like that this film you know uh san francis is not portrayed as this like anti-establishment character with regard to the institutional church like he easily could be um in fact it's quite accurate the way that the film portrays him as like not judging rich people Mm -hmm. um you know not condemning them um and uh his sort of deference to church authority um this thing with the vernacular gospel where he is keeping like you know forbidden a forbidden book according to the church according to this movie you know uh, sort of like tilted in the other direction, maybe slightly. I see. Um, I see. Yeah. Well, I, I think that like with with any with any portrayal of of Saint Francis, it's like the dan- as with probably any saint, the danger is like, is this going to be a redu- a reductive portrayal? Yeah. Like, and and you know, in what way is it going to be reductive? I think Francis is is you know really like vulnerable on this point. Because he can be reduced to the ecology saint, he can be reduced to the social justice saint, he could be reduced to uh, the anti-establishment saint, and like those all may be like valid and are, you know, as far as it goes, like valid takes on these aspects of like what Saint Francis was doing and the impact that he's had. I mean, like he was a provocative and controversial figure. He's still a provocative and yeah. controversial figure, you know, but, but he was a much more joyfully. Yeah, well, you know, figure. it's like I think that I think that like the challenge is like how do you how do you how do you capture all of this without reducing? I mean, and it's I think we touched on a little bit on this too when we talked about little Fla- what we talked about the flowers of Saint Francis. It's like, you know, it's enough to try to do that with a saint, let alone to try to like you know, portray like Jesus or the blessed mother or right. something, you know, like, um, it's, it, it's like, it's enough of a problem to try to like deal with a saint. And especially if you've never met one. Yeah. And so as far as this film goes, like, I think that it, it avoids being as reductive as it might've otherwise been. No, you yeah, know? I agree. I, I think that like it, it, it maybe 
you, there's maybe a few instances where it gestures in the direction of some of these reductive uh, uh, interpretive possibilities. But then I think it also is really trying to adhere to what we've been calling weird, but what I, I might call the uncanny. Um, that's a term that I've heard used in like a theatrical context before to describe like, you know, just sort of like the supernatural or the coincidental or the fateful or like the, you know, the sort of like the the oddness of life, yeah. you know, and and so, you know, if you're an, a, you know, a self-proclaimed atheist director, you know, who also wrote the screenplay, you know, who also wrote the story, like who clearly has this fascination with St. Francis and you're trying to do a film about St. Francis, you know, and avoid reduction. I think that like, you know, that, that you might get Vangelis to come and do the synth uh, right. soundtrack. And then you yeah. might have like, you know, like a flayed corpse hanging from a ceiling, you know, <laughs> like, um, you know, like, yeah. so, so, so yeah. So I, I, again, like, I don't want this all to sound like too much of a criticism. I think that there are real shortcomings, but by that same token, like, I uh, I think that, uh, like I said at the beginning, like I ended up liking the film more than I expected or disliking it less than I expected, yeah. you know? Well, I yeah. think that, you know, you can make it, there are some weird, specific weird things that we might criticize in terms of content later on. But, but I think that, you know, stylistically, you can make it as weird as you want. I, I like plenty of weird movies, you know, but what it comes down to is Francis is supposed to be, is one of the most beloved saints if if not the most beloved saint uh, beyond mary you know in in the christian history and virtually none of the things that people love about him the th and other things that make him appealing and lovable uh are on display in this film and it may be um you know the casting is part of it but that's not that's not all of it you know i mean he he really is not it's he's really quite um, quite a downer, <laughs> you mm. know? Um, and I don't mean in the sense of preaching penance, which is a huge part of St. Francis that is neglected, right? Uh, but uh, just the way that he's portrayed, the emotional tenor of him is is not appealing. And the personality, he doesn't have a winning personality in the slightest, virtually, except for, you know, with the scenes where we see that he's good looking and he can smile, you know, near the beginning of the film. But uh, once he becomes St. Francis, he's like pretty, um, he's pretty unwinning, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's where, that's where the film mostly fails. And we could, we could talk about some specific choices that they make on a spiritual level that are strange, but I think it's, it, a lot of it's just like that the personality of France, St. Francis is, is unrecognizable mm -hmm. virtually in this mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. I really, I like to push back on this. I, again, this sort of idea that the film is stylistically weird because um it, it's the film is a person you know like many films on the list it's a personal response you know it's a notorious kind of response to a story that that is bigger than the, you know, the director and what the director wants to do and i can definitely i think in the film you can definitely see there is there is this kind of push and pull with the question of adaptation and you know how far do the, does the director how far do the filmmakers credit the hagiographical tradition, you know, as kind of one dynamic going on there? Um, how much do they try to like affirm that or subvert it? That's a dynamic going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's other aspects that we haven't even sort of touched on, which is, you know, visually the film is absolutely trying to remain within a certain kind of visual tradition, uh, especially of Italian painting, you know, right. the, the half, uh, the majority of the film are these quite beautifully staged shots, you know, that are directly evoking Caravaggio, framing and lighting um particularly in the lighting like the way and I, I forget the name of the cinematographer but um he did a fantastic job uh mimicking kind of a caravaggian way of look of 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 uh, film lighting um we could look at the music and using this you know synth score which is like of the moment of the when the film is made uh but is very much you know not part of kind of the musical tradition uh, of the church um, around St. Francis. So there's all, all these kind of different aspects that to me suggest somebody who is really trying to, they're, they're, they're reaching for some kind of essence, mm -hmm. uh, just like any number of other great films. I'm not calling this a great film, uh, but that struggle to kind of wrestle with, you know, the mystery of Francis and, and try to uh, bottle that into 
and you know yeah. bottle that lightning into this kind of like film this this particular spin on it you know i find actually quite compelling um and so with that in mind you know stylistic choices like absolutely they are grounds for criticism and stuff but i think we have to be very careful about how we actually do that criticism because you know there's really there's really nothing to say that this is particularly weird you know unless you really you know define the grounds of how it is weird well okay but i just said that it's it's okay it's okay if it's weird um but but the point is that what what does that con- succeed in getting across about saint francis and if we what we get is a is a gloomy weirdo and not the saint francis that is universally described by the early sources then we can say that it's just weird you know yeah and so like i i, I understand that that's a valid take for sure and I guess this is just where I will sort of throw my cards on the table and say that uh, um, I, I kind of, I quite connected actually to this performance. Uh, I quite uh, enjoyed what they were trying to do with, with Mickey Rourke here. Um, and I have a few kind of things that I want to kind of share about that. Um, overall, kind of going with what I was saying about, so at first I want to say like, uh, I can totally understand how it, it does not line up with the sort of the extroverted idea of Francis that comes down to us through the tradition. And so that can definitely have to be a flawed adaptation. Mm-hmm. But what I see kind of replacing that and that what I, I can't speak for the director, but this is kind of what I was getting from the film was that uh, in sort of not using that stuff from the tradition, the director is trying to wrestle with the mystery of Francis, the, the uh, particularly the mystical side. And, and the again, this sort of, the influence that he exerts and the way that people are drawn to him, the attractiveness. Yeah. Uh, she's not doing it through this, again, through the extroverted mm-hmm. uh, aspects of Francis, mm-hmm. um, but she is doing it through something that I think is actually quite incredible. And unlike many of the films we've seen on the list, it gives us an opportunity to kind of talk about like the aspects of like casting. And basically when you, when you are casting an actor, when you're casting a lead actor, uh, there's a whole question of, Am I casting the person who's the best part for the role as written? Or am I casting, really, am I casting the film for the actor? Where, you know, you have these two different kind of ways of approaching a film. Yeah. Uh, some, peop- some films will form out of, hey, I want to work with that actor. And the film will kind of like form itself yeah. around yeah. that. As right. opposed to, or it could be, I want to make a film from this script. And the actor is going to have to form him or herself around that right in this case i think you definitely see the aspect of this director wanted to make a film about francis but also w- whether they wanted to make it she wanted to make it with mickey rourke from the get-go or not i don't know this but is mickey once, rourke's francis once once Fran- yeah. once mickey rourke yeah. is in yeah, yeah. like the film is yeah. is forming itself around mickey rourke and this yeah. isn't this is this is the case with just about every mickey rourke performance yeah out there um and and you will see films throughout his career that they were meant to be him conforming himself to the script <laughs> and they kind of go they, they're they're those yeah. are the ones that like they just hit strangely yeah. dude and uh, but but then there's the ones sorry. that sorry that are formed around him uh-huh. and you see if uh, the biggest best example would be like the the 2009 film the wrestler with uh, by darren aronofsky which was you know made for Rick mickey rourke and yeah. that's a film that's that's you know congeals around him yeah and I, I one of the things i like about this film a lot is, is that, that it, 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 it does that. It, it's it's basically kind of forced to deal with yeah. the Francis that I Mickey like Rourke that. wants to do. I like do. that because I I, um, I I've known several actors who are like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, every once in a while, you meet these guys who, um, and and it's women too, you know. But like uh, these performers who uh, are just like such strong personalities, you know, just like have such a sort of like. I don't know how to describe it, but they're like these, these, these like nuclear reactors going around and, and they just, they will just like run roughshod over a performance, you know, like, but in the most like glorious way. Um, so that like, if you're not accommodating them, it's going to be like, uh, like really difficult, you know, to, um, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, and, uh, and who knows, like, I mean, you could go into like whether that's like a technical uh, deficiency on the part of the actor or not. But like the fact of the matter is, is that like Mickey Rourke is definitely this kind of actor. And and yeah, even before you had gotten to your point, like I already saw where you were going because it was like, yes, like this is totally this is totally a film that like had to just sort of deal with the fact that it's now Mickey Rourke playing no. St. Francis. Right. And I I uh, I think that um, 
Oh, gee, there was something else that I was well, going to say I, on that I, point. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is, the thing about that is that this, you know, this kind of thing could go a couple of ways, right? It could go where if Mickey Rourke doesn't really care to be there or doesn't have an understanding of what he's doing, yeah, the film could be a complete disaster, right? Uh -huh. But what I think is so interesting about the film and what I would say is probably its greatest merit is that Rourke does seem to have a very strong idea yeah. of what he's doing. Yes. The, pro the problem, you know, uh, from the traditional perspective is that it's nothing to do with the historical right, 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 right. But, but at the same time, it is still him i'm i'm certain that it's it's um it's him uh interiorizing what you know he he's getting from the tradition's depiction of francis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and trying to translate it into his own way of expressing that yeah. um again it may not be historically accurate yeah and it may not but, be what anybody wanted to see well know? i would say I, i'm i'm saying like i kind of wanted to see it like, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, well, you I, wanted to see you it know, maybe you're curious about it but yeah. like is it what it's, somebody wants to see in a depiction of saint francis i don't think that's a really I don't, I don't know if that's the best way to put it because like like you know art art doesn't it's not necessary, you know, like, like, like to say, like someone needs to see this. Well, yeah, like, but it's relative to a reality that it's depicting. Like and we, this is the Vatican film list. It's the religion section. It's a movie about a saint. We're expecting some, some reality about the saint. Sure. So, and there is some and, reality. And there is some reality. Yeah. That's I think that, I think that this is a well-observed point. I mean, I think yeah. it, I think that like, if you go into the film with that kind of a framing, you're going to have a different experience than if you go into the film with maybe like uh, the framing that you're articulating, Thomas, yeah. you know, um, like, I think that, that this is the way to enjoy the film. Um, if, if you come at it with like this sort of um, sense of it being somehow a documentation of Mickey Rourke's confrontation well, that's with exactly <laughs> what I'm saying is that's the, not I wouldn't go a film about yeah. same <laughs> but but yeah. but but that's it is in a sense it. it is it's in a interesting. sense I, I'm not that's... claiming the film's not interesting yeah. if you're Here's... saying the film's interesting then I would agree okay I'm not I wouldn't go that far and I, I think that's a legitimate way to enjoy it but but what I what I would say is that I think the film doesn't I don't think the film loses the thread of this is a film about St. Francis. By the, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the film, the film does well. What Rourke's performance does well is it, 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 it captures that aspect of these people around him that are trying to, they, they're just kind of, they're trying to deal with who he is. Uh -huh. And yeah, it's doing it in a way that like in a factual sense is not like the account we have of Francis, but yeah. in terms of the effects and in terms of like people responding to him, like there's, there, there, it's about people ultimately yeah. responding to a mystery. They're responding to like, it's, we don't know what's going on here. Yeah. And, and we as a viewer who are familiar with the tradition, we don't really know what's going right, on. Right. Right. And it's, what's interesting, what's interesting is that the film almost takes the attraction for granted, mm -hmm. right? Because we almost skip the whole process of him attracting people to himself and building up this, this, right. this community. We skip really right to when problems start to happen, you know? Now, I don't know in the timeline of Francis's life if problems were happening from the beginning, but I, you know, I would just venture to guess that the real problems don't happen until after, you know, a sort of critical mass of people have come up around him such that he's not right. able to exude a kind of direct, like, sort of charismatic influence over each and every because one of them. Because there were Franciscan brothers around the world who had never met him or only met him once. Right, and that's and, what the yeah. film sort of depicts. Yeah. And we get this sort of, like, this, this like, council that happens out in, in the grass uh, with, with, like, a bishop and cardinal presiding. And and uh, and there are these, these other Franciscans who have these, like, sort of sharp looking habits yeah. and long hair and There's they a just request for a, a rule that is moderate moderated and this is a very real conflict both within francis's life and in franciscan history yeah is and what's interesting hard to what's, keep his original what's interesting vision. is that this this scene happens about halfway through the film and it's almost like then the film pivots and changes right you know and so it, it, that came as a surprise to me that right. much of the film is dealing with this sort of political reality on the one side, yeah, this political reality on the one side with the church and with the other Franciscan uh, communities and all this, but then also uh, this sense of alienation right. that Francis goes through, right. you know, which... which it's very real. That's yeah. A, that's a real thing. Right. So, and I think that that's like a real thing for Mickey Rourke to tackle. You know what I mean? Like, I think that that is, a, yeah, that is something that Mickey Rourke is equipped to kind of deal with is like this sense of being like, alienated from you know like the rest of uh uh the in the establishment you know right. like this was a guy who who eventually was like rejected pretty pretty hard by the industry yeah. you know yeah. um yeah. and so 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 i think that it's it's interesting that we kind of it's almost like we skip a lot of the 
the attraction and the come and follow me right. and the building up and just go straight to this place of like uh almost like rejection you know and like yeah. uh kind of push him away and and ostracize really. i think even that would be and i agree that that's like all the way that's played is legitimate i mean i think you know you can debate about whether you think saint francis would have been like screaming on the mountain or whatever but before you got the stigmata uh but uh but uh i think that would be better if we hadn't been given a saint francis who's kind of inarticulate from the get-go and, and what i what i mean by that is that if we see a Francis who is reduced to silence by all this opposition, I see. And people can't hear what he's trying to say, and so he then retreats. I think that's more compelling than a St. Francis who, like, barely tries to, like, articulate his vision in the first place beyond, yeah. like, mumbling a few words right. in, like, incomplete sentences. Right. Yeah, it's... I th were you going to say something? Well, I, I, I was going to say that I think may maybe, maybe you were you feel more strongly about this because you actually read quite a bit of Francis's words uh, leading yeah. up to these. And recordings. also I want to keep it grounded in like the fact that this is supposed to be depicting a real person and, and not just like sort of what's interesting, like as an artistic experiment but or something. I don't think it's, I think, I think it's, I, I don't think that's giving the film enough credit in that, um, you know, it is very concerned with like trying to get at the reality of who this guy was. Let me, if I can well, comment, because uh, I, I get what you're saying there with the mystery, right? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, and I agree that that I think you're right that that's what they're trying to do. Let me let me throw this out there, and I'm not sure that I'm right about this, but like, don't you think that like sort of removing the personality as a part of that is sort of like disincarnating Francis a little bit, like because God didn't come down to Earth as like a mystery that people had to deal with. You, you know what I mean? Like, he came as a person who was compelling mm -hmm. and not just a mystery or, like, just what he was doing was mysterious, but it was a person that people were encountering who was beautiful and compelling. Uh, it's not just the fact that they were like, why would this guy, you know, why would this man wander around and, you know, uh, and hang out with tax collectors and sinners and lepers and there's nothing compelling about him but the fact that he's doing mysterious things is in itself compelling no he was a compelling person doing these things that were confounding and part of the reason and if and and honestly if he weren't compelling then they could have just dismissed him you know what i mean uh so so i wonder and i so i'm, I'm not sort of throwing this out as a definitive statement but i wonder if even in that there is a little bit of a cop-out or or if not a cop-out then just like a failure because there's no reason that you can't do both either. And I think that like a more successful film would have still, the fact is God did, get, did give us a Francis who had a compelling personality and spirit and not just a personality per se, but a personality enlivened by spiritual gifts that we don't even necessarily see all of his spiritual gifts in this movie, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. because there is an eloquence of the spirit too right. that we don't get. Right. 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 Yeah. So, yeah, I guess I guess the thing I would say in response, I think that's a great point. I think I'm really glad you said that. Like, I think that's that's an incredibly important point. Um, the thing for me that kind of keeps coming back is that there are many Francis films, and I guess like I feel like there's a burden that we place on movies in particular, and there's probably yeah, there's good reasons, and this is like a whole bigger topic about mm -hmm, the, the yeah. interaction mm -hmm. of truth and beauty within the making of a film, uh, particularly a narrative film, particularly a narrative film about a historical figure, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of complex stuff here, but I think there's a certain burden that we place on films to kind of like get it perfect, yeah. which is appropriate in that, you know, we have a desire for, for perfection, right. In, in seeing a, a great work or just any, anything work we, we want to, we want, we are drawn to things that are more, that are most perfect. So of course we would desire that in a film. Um, but I think uh, when we come to kind of like study it, we don't necessarily apply that same burden to like other art forms that are dealing with the tradition of the saints, uh, particularly with like painting, you know, it's recognizable that there are many ways of painting uh, the story of St. Francis. Now, the obvious, you know, response to that would be painting is not, you know, it's, it's frozen. It's, it's not, shot, yeah. it's not purely, it's, you know, yeah, it's not narrative in the sense that a film is that, and it doesn't have this like burden to truth the way that, uh, a story has kind of a burden to truth. So that's, again, something that, that needs to be unpacked. But um, I guess this analogy just kind of came to mind, and I, I may regret doing this, but um, it made me think for a second of uh, one of my favorite films of recent years, A Hidden Life, which I know right. we all very much I think, yeah. love. Yeah. Um, 
and you know, one of the criticisms that I remember talking with you, Thomas, about, um, I've heard others talking about it with the hidden life is, you know, it doesn't really, you know, get at the full dimension of, uh, Hans Jägerstetter or Franz Jägerstetter as like a, as a saint, particularly as a Catholic saint, yeah. you know, there's yeah. aspects of him and his personality that are missing. Um, but you know, the, the film is, I think we'd all agree the film is a raging success at, you know, what it sets out to do. Um, I guess I feel like I want to afford some of that same latitude to this film. Yeah. Um, because there are many ways of approaching the Francis story, things to yeah. draw out, and one film doesn't have to get it all right. But it's amazing when a film, one film, does get it all right. Yeah, and that's even to be even to a, a, yeah, and, and then it's also amazing when it gets anything right. You know, like <laughs> I think yeah. that like, um, uh, you know, the the fact that we're like able to have like as lively a discussion about this film as we are presently having, I think, is like indicative of of, of something that it manages to accomplish right um but like uh i think that there is this this mental switch that like needs to happen i think for a lot of people in watching films to like treat them as an object you know like as as a an artifact um uh so that it can sort of be considered in itself and not sort of as like not as though it is a complete picture of a reality. I think that that's like what's deceptive about film because it is right. like photographic and documentary. You, you, it, it sort of by, by virtue of the very medium there, it suggests this sort of like complete picture. Yeah. This is the whole thing, you know, but if you can approach a film as an artifact in the way that you would approach a painting or a novel or a poem, you know, that sort of has its own world, you know, um, that isn't necessarily your world, right? Um, then, then, then it can, then it becomes a different interpretive task, you know. And then I think certain things that may be lacking become more, uh, you know, forgivable or even, you know, allowable. Um, uh, even, even, even. Uh, uh, what's what's the adjective I want to use? Like 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 uh, beneficial, you know, or or or, or um, desirable, um, you know. And and I don't know that I'm going to make that case here, but I think that this co discussion that we're having is uh, you know providing the opportunity to like make that point that like this is this is an artifact, and if you can like make that like sort of that switch and like look at it as having you know, all of these layers of artifice that are, that are coming together to create its own little like world, right. you know, then you can sort of like evaluate it on its own terms. And it's, it's, it's not saying that it doesn't have any reference to, to St. Francis, but that the reference doesn't need to be complete or perfect or yeah. total. Mm -hmm. And that like, if it falls short, then we can talk about it as like an imperfect representation of, of francis which i think that this certainly is but we don't necessarily need to cast it as a failure because it may be that those other aspects were never even something that entered into the filmmaker's mind for a moment and that that even had they might have been just re rejected and eschewed for 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 the world that they were trying to create craft you know how much of saint francis can we stand to lose yeah and can we stand to lose the parts i mean the Flowers of St. Francis is selective as well, and it focuses on things. It, it manages to get a lot in there, considering what a particular kind of film it is. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, you know, for example, I didn't really feel like liturgical prayer was something that was missing from the Flowers of St. Francis. I did feel that way in this film, even mm -hmm. though neither of them has any. I mean, there might have been a little bit in the Flowers of St. Francis. Really, neither neither of them has the mass or anything like that. St. Francis is very devoted to the Eucharist. Um, granted, it's an order that was early on mostly non-priests. And I think there was only one priest in the original group. And, and so, you know, that's understandable as well. But I did feel like that was missing from this film in a way that it wasn't, didn't, I didn't feel the loss so much in The Flowers of St. Francis. I don't know that I can explain that very much. Um, well, I just find that interesting because uh, I was actually <laughs> struck by... I didn't think I would be turning into like the defender of this film, but <laughs> but like I was struck by how much Francis is shown praying with the people in Francesco 
Uh, no, I agree with you. There's that, a lot of prayer, but it's not of, liturgical prayer. It's not no, the it's it's uh, spontaneous. But but um, even that inclusion, because I was I guess I was expecting something that was kind of completely stripped of uh-huh. anything to do with spirituality. Um, yeah, I don't think you know. this film is doing that. And again, I think that's one of the best things that one can say about it. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, again, I know that you resonated with this character, but how much of Saint Francis can we can can we lose before it's like you know, there's there's key parts that you have to keep to have it really be a Saint Francis yeah. film. Yeah. And it can't just be like facts about his life, which this film to a large extent respects, you know. Yeah. It has to be something of the person there, I think. Yeah, I think maybe the case that I'm making is not so much it's really not um a positive case in the sense of like the the film has these sort of positive virtues like mickey rourke's performance i think is, is fascinating but it's kind of put in it, it's more um it's more kind of like thrown into relief by what the film lacks in a way but i guess what i'm trying to say is that even still with its flaws it's remarkable how the you could say the the story of saint francis still kind of produces these this kind of residual effects of it can't really be like squelched, you know, yeah, like again, yeah. like the, the, there's this, there's this unbeatable kind of uh, mystery. Again, I keep going back to that, to that word, the mystery of who was this man, this mm-hmm. saint that comes through in the film. And I think the mm-hmm. filmmakers were, you know, um, caught up in that and yeah. even maybe against their will. Um, and he probably does come through best when he's with his brothers in mm-hmm. sort of the middle section of this, the film, like the scene where, somebody gives them a lamb and no, none of them knows how to kill the lamb. And they yeah. finally decide just not, not to kill, you know, that's, yeah. that's a very, that's a very, you know, that could be in the flowers of St. Francis. Yes. Yeah. You know? There's a really like, uh, uh, like effect, like heartwarming scene where they're all sleeping together, sort of huddled up. And then one of the brothers wakes yeah. up hungry and, uh, uh, you know, Francis tells him, like, don't be embarrassed, like, go ahead, eat, you know, it's, really it's like, great. those it's moments great are nice. Scene. I don't know if it's taken from any particular source, but it's totally in line. Yeah. You know. And, you know, there was like something odd for me at the end of this film where, um, well, first off, I'll say, like, Nathan, I totally agree with like the, the painting-esque uh, quality, uh, the, the way that you described the visual style here, because it's seldom that I'm watching a film and I literally have the thought, like, oh, this looks like a painting or like a painting that I've seen. But um, at the end, when he's praying by himself and he's like in agony, I like thought of depictions of St. Pra- Francis in prayer that I've seen in painting, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and it was very like uh, suggestive of that, you know. Um, uh, it was like a very a spontaneous connection, you know. But then also at the end when he receives the stigmata, and he has like this kind of amazing response of like, like, like wonder. Right. Um, I had this feeling of like, where was this Francis all along? Right. Did anybody else feel that? Right. Like, I just at the end, I just felt like this is such a beautiful, like wondrous, um, joyful yeah. uh, uh, response. Yeah. And and it was very moving. But I kind of thought. I didn't see this at any other point, like yeah. along the way, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of, in that moment, I, I didn't like really realize the lack until I felt it for, for it's being, uh, fulfilled in the end there, you know, of like this, right. this, I don't know, this warmth, this like, um, love, I guess. I mean, I don't know, like, but yeah. it was something about like, Mickey Rourke's performance there at the end that was so touching that it made me think, oh, gee, like, this was kind of missing. Yeah. You know? What do you think about him his screaming immediately before that? <laughs> the, the bad lieutenant. Is, uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's what you have screaming. maybe that's what you have to do to get to that final know, final yeah. final uh yeah. emotional state that uh that uh that we we were yeah. given. And is you that know? like a you think like St. Francis would have been up there like screaming to God? Who like, knows, man? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But probably not. <laughs> um I really want to talk about the thing that we haven't been talking about. I think we've yeah. ramped up enough. The, and this is the scene that would like, you know, aside from other like random nudity in the film would probably like just ruin the film for yes. most people. Right. Yeah. Just like, we're not even going to watch this. Our family will not watch this, you know, like, whatever. yeah. Uh, so there's this scene where uh, St. Francis is depicted being tempted um, 
there's like a not suggest- even in any sort of like external like like yeah. uh it's hardly way. even it's explained just- to us until after the fact that he's been tempted he sees a mother and her child and the story is that the devil suggested to him that he could have like a family of his own we we cut to saint francis sort of exuberantly stripping off his clothes this is the only like exuberant nakedness that we get in the film and he's rolling on this snowy hillside and the weird part comes it's so weird yeah the weird part comes where he's like packing snow around his lower body and like onto his groin and like moaning in this very like ambiguous way sort of writhing and um and then the dis- and then the-, <laughs> the end result <laughs> and then the disciples his brothers come and Nathan and I were cracking up at just their facial expressions <laughs> because like the actors themselves are like smiling in this like what's going on kind of way <laughs> what did i wander um, into <laughs> like um but uh but uh he he says you know forgive me i was i have been tempted you know he says he says this is this is my he's he's making we cut to him making two snowmen he says this is my wife and this is my my son uh forgive me i have been tempted so it's like was he making the snow people was that part of his temptation i think in the story he in the original story what i read is that like he makes these snow people to like to like mock the devil's like temptation suggestion that he could have a family and in this he's like forgive me so he's like is it suggesting that like he gave into temptation because no 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 i think it's just that it's this it's this it's this flawed idea that temptation itself is culpable yeah. Right. I think that's it. I think it's just a, a theological, uh, a moral mistake. You know, like that he's apologizing for having had the temptation. Of course, you know anybody would know that we're all tempted, and that that's not blameworthy. Right. But like, but I think it's just a a, a okay. fault of the filmmaker to have Francis apologize for having been tempted. Okay. Um, but, but there is but what's sort of weird, like a weird ambiguity of like his building the snowman. Yeah. And then like the whole moaning and the yeah. Snows. Well, what's weird is that like he. It, it suggested that to me at least that he's like building the snowmen as he's going through this like writhing he's like packing the snow and piling it on top like that's the act of building the snowman right oh, so okay. it, so there is something like i think kind of suggestive about it it's like almost sexual and then the result is like these these snow these snow beings yeah you know and and so so i just think that it's just too I think it's too without taste, you also, know. Also, like, like we see Francis fully nude. We see his his private parts, you know, in this scene. That in itself is like totally unnecessary. Sure. And, um, sure, sure, sure. I think just the way the film deals with nudity, it's either like just too shameless or like too shameful yeah different scenes totally yeah yeah i wasn't comfortable with the nudity at the beginning of the film as they're piling the mass grave Mm -hmm. and then uh and then yeah you know like certainly you know here uh it's it's not so much the nudity that i have an issue with um although i i you know i would have an issue with certain kinds of nudity with saint francis but um with anybody uh but uh but here it's it's the it's yeah it's this sort of like uh ambiguous like erotic aspect to the rolling in the snow right like it is erotic in a sense like in the classical sense you know it's a heroic act you know and like it's involving the senses like and and this like this uh chastising of them but that's that's the thing is that like there's a lot about this film that doesn't feel particularly chaste. I don't mean it in the in a specifically like sexual mode. I mean it in like a sort of um uh uh I don't know like like maybe like a, a certain yeah a certain discretion and and maybe even a certain like uh like lack of ego or like narcissism like um there's there's almost like a kind of like narcissism in some of these depictions. Um, uh, I don't know if, if, if I'm, if I'm, what would be an example? Um, well, like, like, uh, at the, 
at the beginning when he when he does like one of his first acts of charity, like when this is taking us away from from this scene, but like when he sees Claire give like some coins to this beggar and he like responds by like grabbing a ton of coins and giving them to the beggar, you know, I, I don't know. Like there was something about that. Oh, that... well, my reading of that is that he is doing that solely to impress Claire because she's a cute right, girl. Right, right, right. This is right. before his conversion. Right. But well, but it's like the beginning of his conversion. It's, it's starting to happen. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, this is after he's gotten back from prison and he's been reading the gospel and like things are starting to happen. But that was probably like the first moment that I noticed it. That like here was an act that I think is like full of ego, but is like ambiguously like um, held up as as like you know a a an act of charity. Interesting. I I I I didn't read it as being held up as an act of charity. I read it as being just like this is how immature he is that he's doing this solely to impress this girl and it's totally insincere. I see. Well, so 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 I so I, I I kind of come back to that with this depiction of uh, the rolling in the snow. Like I don't know, there's just like something that's kind of like uh, yeah, like like exhibitionist about it in a way that I think that someone actually engaged in chastening themselves might not have had that that like that that sense but i don't know i'm not you know i'm not someone who like uh who 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 resists temptation to the point of throwing himself in the snow you know like i'm i am someone who's like who's who who lacks uh mortification in my life so maybe i who am i to like say that this isn't like a a uh you know uh like well it's weird there's the eroticism and then there's this sort of like there, yeah, there is something of like the self in it. There's something of like this is my sounding my barbaric yop, or right, whatever right. you know. Right, right, I don't right, know how right, I right, it, right, but. right. Anyway, maybe that's an upset. I don't know, Nathan. Do you, do you have anything to say about? It? You're going to tell us actually the scene really, about, really yeah, affected yeah, me yeah. deeply. There's something yeah. of like, there's something <laughs> of like, there's something of like pop spirituality to it somehow. Yeah. I don't know. No, I I found the scene you know disturbing insofar that, um, and I think this is this is maybe an area where you see the director's kind of like her background coming into play. Like it's it's I I interpreted the scene as it's an yeah it's it's a it, it tilts towards the erotic because that's that's what the director, for what I can understand, understands like as something kind of mysterious and beyond reason. Um, and there's another part of the film that I think actually tilts in this direction too, where basically because um, this is my what I think maybe she was grappling with because she can't make sense of like the mystery of someone loving chastity so much that you know that they would force themselves to do that. You know, there it has to be. They have to bring in this kind of like Freudian like yeah. repression thing, yeah, where it's yeah, like, yeah. oh no, no, like the you know the the physical impulse still cannot be denied. So right. this is our like modern twentieth century. Right. Um, we get the real interpretation of what was really going on there that the hagiographers kind of. It's like when people with. make like you know medieval like self-flagellation into like a sadomasochistic. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. So right. I think it's I think there's an imposition there, and, and given the director's background, you know, making somewhat as you alluded to earlier, sadomasochistic um, films. Yeah, right. like I think she's predisposed to read things in that way. I see. Um, and probably that's part of the appeal of Francis and and just someone who's so extreme, you know, that that it's, there's something attractive about that, you know, yeah. for her to kind of wrestle with. Um, there was another aspect that that I found kind of disturbing which was actually the um when francis uh kisses the leper um in uh which uh, in the timeline if i don't know actually where that happens in the timeline of his life uh-huh. but it struck me I, I mean my my impression of that scene of when he's embracing the leper like there's something almost kind of coercive about it um there's something kind of like erotic about it depending on I didn't know. Yeah, interesting. Um, like yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i think yeah. rourke is playing it I, my impression i don't know the, the way rourke is playing it is very like kind of ambiguous mm. um but it didn't exactly exude like this sort of very charitable kind of like that's yeah that, that is interesting, you know, interesting. there was something yeah. very I didn't there was something it. kind of coercive about it yeah that, well that now that you mention me. it like i remember feeling yeah. that way and this again is like 
another instance of what I'm ha struggling to describe and what I'm choosing to describe as like narcissistic. It's like he forces himself on this leper yeah, and of. there is like a, like something in the way that he's embracing him and, and cradling him that feels, uh, yeah, like almost the way you would hold a lover, you yeah, know, yeah. which is very different than the way we see Francis embrace the leper in, uh, flowers of St. Francis, you know, yeah. um, now that you mentioned it, I remember feeling similarly like, wow, yeah, this is, this is uncomfortable. You know, I don't think it's now, supposed to be sexual though. I think it's supposed to be tender. You know, I think, I think that's, but maybe that's like, to, yeah, yeah, maybe that's but, the, a failure to understand tenderness that's, and to that's, contextualize that's it as think, like a, a, an, an erotic thing. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, like I think that there's a case to be made that like, that male tenderness has been like in a large part subsumed in popular consciousness into homosexuality, you know, like right. in homoeroticism. Well, it goes both know? ways though, right? Like you can, uh, yeah, that can also lead to interpreting male tenderness. Fine, fine. You know, fair enough. Fair life. enough. Fair enough. Right. That's a, that's fair enough. But when taken together with all these other things that we're observing okay. about the film, I think it's worth, worth, I think it's, it can't be discounted. Interesting. You know? I think the thing is like, the difference, like in the, in Frances Francesco, like the leper is actually like actively resisting. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and the, you know, yeah, we, we understand that's because he's a leper and he doesn't want to get Francis infected. Right. But that's not really like, it's not even clear that by the end. Yeah. You know? that he's, and and he's Francis even... is very kind of intently like, come yeah. here, you know, like yeah. uh, in flowers of St. Francis, you know, I, I, you know, the depiction of the same scene is very, you know, it's very clearly tied to, spiritual that there's, there's this moment of prayer that that it then you know god provide brings mm -hmm. the leper into his path to fulfill this kind of desire that he has of loving god but the leper is also extremely like he just kind of uh he just kind of accepts it and yeah it's just kind of like it's just yeah. a very different kind of well like, i i think also that, it's a more restrained gesture he sort of like kisses each of his shoulder he puts right. his face on each yeah. of his shoulders right and, right, right. It, it's yeah. a more chaste gesture you know like and i i don't mean again not chaste in like this specifically sexual mode but there is yeah. like a discretion okay. there you know but but i I'm, I'm glad that we've kind of like ended up with this scene because i, I think it takes us for full circle in the discussion where i think that this film is like in a lot of ways, a, a, a drawn out meditation on all of these ways that Francis is rejected, you know, or, or puts off people, even including the very lepers that he's embracing, you know, um, so that like, uh, we can, we can, we can say that like the film is imperfect or falls short and falls short in these different ways. But it seems clear to me that the director is, is dramatizing this certain reality that, that Francis you know, is, is a, a figure that is not, you know, uh, like easily accepted, you know, yeah. that, 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 like that, that, uh, that he was rejected then and he's rejected now. And, and that, uh, you know, if, if, if you go into the film thinking about it that way, well, then there might be something like new to, to pick up on or appreciate about this figure that the film can help you to do. But if like this discussion about this, like, this rolling in the snow scene like totally puts you off then yeah probably just steer clear of this film yeah not highly recommended um, <laughs> yeah. but uh hey it's on the list we had to discuss it i wouldn't have included it i don't think any of us would have included it on the vatican no. film list so that concludes our discussion of saint films on the vatican film list wow. we've done all of the saint films on the list wow um and um thank you nathan for for joining us again and joining us on so many of the saint films yes, i mean yes. i don't know was it yeah. on all of the saint films mm. not all of them not okay. monsieur no. vincent for instance and not gandhi yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so we got to wrap up um but uh james why don't you tell people about the fall campaign which oh, will have started by the time this episode great comes yes out. yes yes so we're in the middle of our fall campaign or at least we will be in the middle of our fall campaign by the time you're listening to this, dear listener. Um, we have a big grant. I'm still in the midst of, of trying to raise this grant, but it is over $100,000 um, that we're trying to to get matched. Um, so certain donors have come together to offer us this grant, which we really need. But the catch is, is that we don't get it unless we can manage to raise matching funds during this campaign. I should clarify, this is not a campaign for Criteria, the Catholic film podcast yeah. specifically. This is for <laughs> CatholicCulture.org, which is a website with a lot of different things. This being a Thanks for small, making that this, point. This being a very small part of it. <laughs> it does yeah. not cost us yeah. over $100,000 to make this, yeah. this podcast. No, no, no. So Although this is like I wish. the least of the productions of CatholicCulture.org. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah so. But yeah, so CatholicCulture.org is in the middle 
of this big campaign. So if you enjoy this show or any of the other shows that are in our podcast network, or if you're familiar with all of the other things that we do over on the website with liturgical year resources and Catholic world news and commentary and our vast library and the list goes on and on, then this is really a perfect time to, to give to help us out because your gift will count twice. Um, you know, it'll, 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 whatever you give will be valued in itself and it will help toward us winning this $100,000 plus grant. Um, so, uh, head when over... there's the campaign on the feast, it campaign ends on the feast of the Immaculate Conception. That's right. December 8th. Yeah. So, uh, we only have about six or seven weeks to, to raise all yeah. this money. So time really is of the essence. Don't wait. Um, as soon as you listen to this and think, Man, these guys, they got something going on. I think they're worth a cup of coffee. Then uh, <laughs> head over to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. And then that way we'll know that you're specifically giving uh, to our audio development. But um, but yeah, catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Uh, yeah, we, thank pre you. we appreciate it. We pray for our benefactors daily. Um, and uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.